Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking about the challenge of balancing the state's budget. Oregon has record revenue, but it's still not enough. There's a gaping budget hole of $1.4 billion. We heard in our first segment from Republican House Minority Leader Mike McLean. Now it's the Democrats' turn. Welcome to my guest, House Deputy Majority Whip Barbara Smith Warner. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's your first time here. It's it great is. to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Governor Brown has said with less than two months left in the legislative session that the stakes couldn't be higher. Would you agree with that? How would you describe what's before lawmakers right now? Sure. I think the governor is right. We are in a situation where uh, even in a time of, uh, you know, record economic growth, super low, uh, super low unemployment, yet still we have this systemic uh, shortfall in our revenue system. And it really is indicative of the fact that we have been trying to kind of um, to get through, to deal with an uneven revenue system that has with declining sources of revenue over time that can't keep up with our increasing costs. And we really need to find a new way forward. And I'm happy that uh, Speaker Kotek um, and other House Democrats have introduced the Education Investment Initiative to really say, do we want to keep putting Band-Aids on all of our problems, or do we want to shift and, and really change the conversation and decide to invest in the long term in the way we fund our schools, our health care, our public safety, everything that Oregonians care about. When you talk about the education investment initiative, are you talking about the business tax? Yes, as a matter of fact. So right now, uh, and for years here, we have had a declining uh, amount of taxes paid by businesses. The corporate income tax structure in this state used to be about 18% uh, of our uh, revenue came from that corporate income tax. It sounded less than 6% now for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is it's based on the national, on the federal corporate income tax, which has been declining as well. And because you only pay a portion of that to the state of Oregon, that's been declining. Also, fewer businesses are organizing themselves in different ways. So it has been a a declining amount. So indeed, people who are working for a living, income taxes, people who uh, get paid like you and I do, have paid more and more of that income and less and less is coming from the businesses. So what we're doing is we are saying, let's get rid of that out of date corporate income tax structure and let's start and again. Replace it with something let's else. Let's start again, exactly. Um, what we're talking about uh, is, is a program that will have a, a, a much lower rate, much more broadly applied, and that will, will match the growth in our economy in a way that our very heavily dependent on personal income tax system has not been able to. We've instead, when times are good, Receipts are good, but boy, when times are bad, receipts are worse. This is going to give us a much more stable, ongoing source where everybody's paying their fair Critics share. Critics say it's, it's Measure 97 light. Measure 97 was yeah. rejected by voters last fall. Uh, people say it's a sales tax in disguise. Right. Right. How do you respond? Well, even um, I, now, I did support my Measure 97, but even many folks, a business community, and other places who did not support it agree that this is a very different uh, proposal. Number one, it was developed by legislators, so we were able to say, okay, here are some unintended consequences. So how do we adjust for that? So it went through the, a more thorough, thoughtful process uh, and came out of the legislature rather than uh, being put on the ballot. Number two, it provides 200 million dollars in uh, low and, and middle income tax relief. And number three, 75% of it will be dedicated directly to education. This means uh, we're hoping to add a couple more weeks to the school year, reinvest in higher education. And you know, as a mom of two kids in public schools myself, that is the most important thing we can do. We've spent ever since um, Measure 5 in the 90s, which said, okay, we're not going to fund our schools through property taxes anymore. Hey, state of Oregon, now you're going to do it. But we never replace that money with anything. So we've been struggling to get by and, and scraping this and cutting that and never replacing that. And I think this is an opportunity to, like I said, stop with the Band-Aids and really invest in the future. We have a, a compromise we're hearing about between a plan by Senator Mark Hass and a plan by House Speaker Kotek, which are, are different. I think Senator Mark Hass is much less money, $600 million in revenue, and Tina Kotek started with $2 billion. And I, I asked Mike McLean about that in the first segment, and he says these are this is a compromise, a negotiation between Democrats, but Democrats aren't reaching out to Republicans and, and getting their input. Why not? Um, I, I don't agree with that. I serve on a joint tax committee that is made up of the Senate and the House 
um, individual tax committees, and we have been meeting jointly. There's a work group that I uh, that that even before the joint tax committee of House and Senate members, Democrats and Republicans, um, that everybody has been represented on, and they continue to have these conversations. Um, I believe that, that everybody has had a seat at the table. Ultimately, we have to get a supermajority of votes. You know, so you need some Republicans. That's support. exactly right. That's exactly right. Do you favor uh, Mark House's plan that it's less money covering more businesses, or or Tina Kotek's plan that's more money covering fewer businesses? Well, I believe that really what we need to do is say. What is our need? What do we need to get to so that we can indeed deal with those systemic problems that we have? We have a deficit right now, but we, looking forward, will continue to have that. So how do we reset ourselves so that we give ourselves the opportunity to really invest in everything from education to health care to public safety that we care about in the long term? So my goal is to help support a plan that can provide us with significant investment level of revenue that can um, that can be as fair as possible so that everybody's paying their fair share. And indeed, I think either of those plans are going to have a sig I mean, you're talking worst case. Right now, the corporate tax rate is between 7 and 9 percent. And uh, the highest tax rate that we're talking about now is less than 1 percent. But it's the spreading it more broadly. So I believe that we will work hard to get to um, whatever, whatever proposal that we can come to agreement and agree that this is going to get us. And get some Republican support. Amen. One in each chamber, yeah, right? At least. Well, Mike McLean says that Democrats, you've heard this before, I'm sure, have a spending problem. And so not a revenue problem. So what you need to do first and to get their support, you need to show them that you're going to rein in costs. And he's talking about PERS, health care coverage. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to make some concessions on PERS and make some reforms there? Right. Well, you know, when we think about where we got to where we are, how where we are today with the, with the budget and the revenue system, it's there's a lot of blame to go around, to be quite blunt. Uh, voters, former legislators, whether it was mandatory minimums, um, corporate tax rates, property tax, there have been a lot of decisions made by a lot of folks that have ended up where we are now. And we put forward, um, I'm, I'm involved in, a, in the budget writing committee, and we put forward a full cuts um, where we are budget. And we repeatedly, and most of what we spend, as, I, as, I, as we've talked about before, it's health care, education, and public safety. That's 89% of what we spend. And I've got a lot, I don't have constituents who are saying, yes, let's kick more people off the Oregon health plan or get rid of Oregon Project Independence. We need to balance that. And part of the proposal um, that we've talked about, uh, as the House Democrats particularly, is to do real and significant cost containment. We are looking at public safety opportunities um, to bring down costs there. We are looking at cost containment in, um, in, the, in the state health care systems. That has been part of the conversation all along. We've had a series of groups working on what do we do for cost containment in health care? What do we do for cost containment in public safety? in public safety, we do understand that it's all of a piece and it all has to come together in order to not just, um, in order to, to make it sustainable for the long term. I want to read you a quote from a, a school board member at the North San Am School Board and the Oregon School Boards Association Board, Tass Morrison. And uh, she wrote an editorial published the day before the revenue forecast came out and said, Oregon desperately needs revenue reform. She's frustrated at the lack of solutions. She writes in part, our schools have been mired in crisis since the recession, yet our legislature is proposing even more cuts. A two-year budget of $7.8 billion, effectively creating a $600 million shortfall. I am astounded and utterly disappointed that our elected leaders from the governor on down are unwilling or unable to fund our schools at even a break-even level for the next two years. Even worse, amid a booming economy, our elected leaders have failed to come together to forge the long-term solution of revenue reform that our state so desperately needs. Our business and industry leaders share the responsibility for this failure by acting as an impediment to solutions. We have about a minute and a half left, but I, there's a lot in that quote, but one of the things, and I know you're, you're on the education subcommittee of ways and means mm -hmm. What is going to be the number for education? They're trying right. to budget in the dark, not having any number. Where right. is that going to fall? Is it going to be 7.8 billion? Is it going to be 8.1 billion? Right. I think it's, it is really going to depend on where we get to in this revenue conversation. We initially said, OK, here's what we have. Here's how much money we have. The, 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 the budget writer said, with the, with the funds that we have now, we can, fund, we can only fund. We can't even quite get to $7.9 billion. And that's not, that's not how we want to do things. That's 
that's not the investment level we want to make in our kids. That That's why I came to the legislature was to try to make a difference. I always say having my kids start school made my support for public education go from the abstract to the concrete because I see the impacts that years and years of cuts that indeed unstable budgeting, the up and down budget cycles, by taking this education investment um, opportunity, we can do, shift ourselves away from that and say, here is a source that we are finally replacing the money that we lost and dedicating it 75% to education so that we can not only help that K-12, and that's how we invest in our future. We have this in-migration and our kids have to be getting the kind of educations that will let them be, be successes in the future so that we can help our state continue to grow and thrive. So I believe the Education Investment Initiative will indeed be what has been called for by many. And I ask, I urge those school board members, I urge every business leader who says that this is a priority to join us, come and have this conversation. It sounds like a lot hinges on this business tax or the Education Investment Initiative, so we'll be hearing a lot more about it, I'm sure. Thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk, Representative Barbara Smith-Warner. Appreciate having you on. Straight Talk airs twice a week, Sundays at 6.30 p.m. right after NBC Nightly News and Saturdays at 4.30 p.m. Thanks for watching. Senator Ron Wyden is my guest next week. We'll see you then for Straight Talk.